In studio with the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield, Maria Lawrenson, and via telephone, Senator Jason Barrett. JB, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. So uh, let's start first with the big, uh, the big guy, and that's the tax plan that the Senate sent over uh, to the House. We're hearing good things from Delegate Eric Halsorter, the House Majority Leader, and Delegate Mike Hornby, who we've had on the program, both of those uh, gentlemen today. And it seems like they both feel that this Senate bill will be passed with very few changes, if uh, any. Uh, Jason, what are you hearing? Well, I, I think that's accurate. I, I don't know that there are going to be any changes. Um, uh, this has been an ongoing negotiation throughout the entire session, and uh, we were able to work through it just as the process uh, should play out. So uh, I'm extremely optimistic that the House is going to pass uh, the Senate plan, or, or the compromise plan, the Senate bill, I should say. You can't make everybody happy, but there are uh, some people very unhappy that the marriage penalty once again will go unaddressed in West Virginia, Jason. Yeah, and I'm one of those folks. Um, and and as we were trying to work through that, the dollar amount on that was just uh, so large. And it's something that I think that we need to come back and address, certainly in the future. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, values in West Virginia that are, that are very conservative. And, um, you know, I think that having a marriage penalty goes against a lot of uh, values that West Virginians share. So um, I absolutely think that we should come back in the future, address this penal, uh, this marriage penalty correctly and, and, and fix it. Was the idea behind not addressing that as a primary item that uh, you wanted to address a personal income tax, which would affect everybody, not just do tax reform for those who are under the married category? Yeah, I just think that, you know, we had, obviously, when you have the, the Senate, the House, and the governor's office all trying to uh, to negotiate, um, and everybody, you know, had very strong views on, on what they thought was the, the, the best plan, plan forward. Um, and so as you do those compromises, um, you know, unfortunately, something had to lose out, and, and you know, it, it was the marriage penalty is what lost out. But, um, you know, because we had to give, um, you know, every, every group there had to get to, to do a little give and take, so... Um, that's just the way it played out. All right. Uh, hey, I'm not sure where this stands with the Senate. Uh, the House passed a deliberate intent bill, SB 3270, 54, uh, 5245 yesterday. Has that already gone through the Senate, Jason, or does it now go to you? No, it's a, uh, that's a House bill. So it is um, over in the Senate now. Uh, I don't know that it's been reported out or been referred to a committee yet. Uh, but th if that hasn't happened, that will happen, and it would uh, I'm sure go to the Judiciary Committee. And we spoke with Delegate Householder earlier this morning who told us that up to uh, February 27, the revenue numbers showed a 70-plus million dollar surplus through February 27. 76 million is what he said with another day to go uh, in the month, which would then put the uh, surplus at a billion, 71 million for the year. Correct. Okay, so uh, I know you serve on the Finance Committee in the Senate as well. What are you projecting the end-of-year surplus to be this year? Well, originally, um, well, I don't say originally, but but a few months back, uh, I think that projection was around 1.7. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to quite meet that um, threshold, but, um, you know, I think 1.415 is certainly uh, attainable. What are between now and uh, July one? What are the biggest revenue months traditionally for the state? Uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to say that incorrectly. Um, I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I, I think April's it, April was the first thing that came to mind, and I, I could be completely wrong about that. But but that was one that that really came to mind uh, when you asked that question. But I, I don't want to give you any in, in, incorrect information. Bill. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Jason. Uh, morning. Getting, getting away from the uh, tax uh, bill for just a couple minutes. Uh, the uh, John Harder's effort to change the county commission, county uh, county commission, county council back to county commission did not pass in the house uh he mentioned someone mentioned that you're trying to push this in the senate side is there any optimism at all that we'll get it through in the senate side we already passed it out of the senate oh you uh, did actually okay the, the president was the lead sponsor of the bill it is now in the house of government organization committee unfortunately and, and the attorney there believes that it's unconstitutional um but in conversation that i had with um some other senators from the eastern panhandle we're going to try to um, have a conversation with the folks in the House Government Organization uh, Committee to, you know, to ease their mind that it's not unconstitutional and 
um, get the bill moving forward. Uh, Jason, in the event that the uh, it does not pass the House, is the, is the solution as simple as at the next uh, referendum that uh, that issue is placed on the referendum? Well, if somebody, if it's actually determined to be unconstitutional, which I wouldn't believe, um, then you, you could have a constitutional amendment on the ballot to, to yeah. say that a county commission could be composed uh, of up to five members instead of three. No, I'm sorry. You misunderstood me. Uh, I'm not talking about a statewide uh, constitutional amendment. I'm talking about a referendum on the county's budget because that's it was instituted with a countywide referendum. So if it's instituted, it could be could be reversed by a countywide referendum. Well, it was changed on a county referendum because the law prohibits, that was the interpretation, that the law prohibited a county commission from composing of five. Yeah, I understand. And, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. if then if that's the law, uh, or that was the interpretation of the law, then it cannot go back to three uh, if you cannot have three. And so what this bill does is just change the name. It really doesn't change the the... the designation in code this is just a a name change to the berkeley county council to call it the berkeley county commission so yeah. that's why i said in answer to your question that if it is determined to be unconstitutional a county referendum can't override the state constitution that's why it would have to go before the entire state okay well i'm i'm confused because uh when when it was put on the ballot there were two parts to it one was going from three to five the second uh -huh. part was changing the name that we thought was was required to go from three to five so i thought since, right. since it was done well, with a county-wide referendum i would think we could reverse it with a county well referendum. i think that the part that you're missing is that that second part that was passed to change the name is because the law did not allow it to be called a commission anymore. So you had to do that. You can't go back if it still violates the state law. You can't un, you, you can't have another referendum to, to name it something that's illegal. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. So I'm confused. Is the Jefferson County Commission comprised of five members? Yes, but they're grandfathered in. Yeah. Oh, and, and, okay, okay, and, okay, okay. And the thing with the with Berkeley County, the the real, real issue was not the name. I got uh, it. But they said that you had to change the name when you made a structural change. I which see. Which a structural change was made from three to five. I see. Because I see. the commission was defined as three members. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, Jason, um, your name was invoked um, by several of your colleagues earlier in a good way, where your ears burning. Um, I'm but, just glad it's in a good way this time. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But, um, you know, obviously uh, the House, after a very impassioned speech by Delegate John Hardy, um, shot down yet again the locality pay issue. But um, both of the folks who were on earlier said they feel optimistic the numbers are getting closer on and on 50 to 46 um but we understood that you have a bill as well um and do you have any uh flash of optimism about that uh passing both um uh you know both both houses um what what's your sense of that well, I'm, I'm very optimistic that it's going to pass the Senate, and that's actually yeah. going to happen. To, that's going to happen today. Okay. Uh, Senate Bill, uh, I, I, I should know better than to throw numbers out here because <laughs> I get them wrong sometimes. But I believe it's 593 mm -hmm. uh, that that requires every state agency to develop a locality pay plan. Um, and so we're going to send that over to the House today, and barring some something unforeseen. And I really, and I talked to a few delegates uh, yesterday evening from all parts of the state, uh, some of which voted against the bill. And um, th th it seems to be that the, the problem that they're having over there uh, is the same problem that we had last year in the House when we were dealing with a locality pay bill for state police. And that is that in the, the bill last year said it, it, that the superintendent of the state police could provide up to ten thousand dollars in a, a locality pay wasn't wasn't the term that was used but sure. that was the intent up to three counties and that's why that was defeated because members said look if you know, we shouldn't limit this to a number of counties if, if there's if we, we support the idea of locality pay but when you put the number three in there that's where they had heartburn so this year the house has another bill that uh it's a locality pay bill that was defeated yesterday that 
now says that they create this commission, the commission comes up with a plan, comes starts a fund, and it can go to five counties. And so my bill does not mention any it does not mention any word of a number of counties that would qualify. This simply says that each agency develop their own locality pay plan. And and I've had some members be critical of why are we having multiple different plans for different agencies. Well, some agencies have a much harder time than others uh, recruiting employees, and they need to have the flexibility. If it's CPS workers or uh, whatever agency, they have a, a hard time getting those employees as compared to maybe DEP or somebody else. I'm, I'm just throwing examples out here, but th th it's not a one-size-fits-all. And I think that we've clearly shown that the legislature hasn't been able to come up with a plan or any type of formula that, that we can really, that, that addresses all agencies uh, and that we can get past. And so I think it's just, it's just better to let these agencies have the discretion and the flexibility to, um, you know, to develop their own locality pay plan that, that works for them. And we may see as all these different agencies develop plans, we may see an agency or two really come up with a, a, a really great concept um, and we can take pieces of that and, and, and implement that into an agency that, that maybe didn't do a very good job of developing a locality pay plan. Jason, I, I assume you've talked to the agencies about this. Do you think the agencies will be any more successful in doing a locality pay plan than what the legislators have been? As long as they have adequate funding to pay for it, sure. I mean, they're, they're coming to us, you know, the state police, uh, corrections, uh, DHHR with CPS, they, they have come to us and said, please, we need these additional resources for certain areas of the state. We cannot recruit, we cannot retain our employees because we're just not competitive um, uh, in salary. Okay. And so they're asking for this. And so, um, you know, I, it, I think it's much easier. You know, they don't, the agency doesn't have to take it up for a vote. They just have to come up with a plan. And as long as the um, the legislature in the future, you know, provides them enough funding to be able to, um, uh, you know, to, to be able to give those raises, and yeah, I don't think it'll be an issue. Do you and, think, you know, what, go ahead. No, he's going to so using the teachers, for example. Do you think mm -hmm. the uh, State Board of Education is going to provide pay raises for the Eastern Panhandle and not for the southern part of the state? <laughs> well, and the, the teachers and the school service personnel are, are the hardest ones to deal with. And, and, I, and, I, and I say that not, not because of the individuals. I, I'm talking about the structure in which uh, they're paid and their salaries are determined. And number one, it's in code. Uh, number two, uh, there's a school aid formula and there are court cases that, that say that one teacher can't be paid X number of dollars more or X percent more than another county. Uh, levies play some role into the uh, um, school aid formula, I mean, ultimately, my opinion is that the school aid formula um, is convoluted, it's complex. There are very few people that actually understand all of the school aid formula. Um, you know, I think a long term, we, we need to reevaluate the school aid formula. For example, Berkeley County, uh, the amount of employees they have far exceed the amount of funding they get uh, for the number of uh, FTE, full-time employees that they actually uh, have. So the school aid formula determines how many employees you should have, how many teachers you should have, how many school personnel you should have, uh, and then you get money from the, the county gets money from the uh, uh, State Department of Education to fund those positions. But Berkeley County is well in excess of those that number of positions. Yeah, I'm, yeah, and I agree with that. First, let me applaud you for thinking out of the box. Uh, but the second thing is playing the devil's advocate. I I wonder if by th by your by this approach, that's going to be much much more difficult for the teachers ever to see a locality pay. Well, I, again, this this requires and this bill requires each county to come up with some plan, some idea of what they need, uh, and then the, obviously all this will be reported back to the legislature. Um, and then that's when we can uh, we can go in and deal with but teachers and personnel aren't the only ones that are in code. The state police are in code as well. Their salary. So, you know, I think there's uh, this absolutely moves the conversation forward. Uh, without without this plan, um, I don't know how we ever get there. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here on the program. I know the Senate is considering several bills as we get uh, closer to the deadline here. Jason, what are some of the bills that you'd like to see passed that have not yet been sent through the Senate? 
Well, we, we are about finished with Senate <laughs> bills, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I, we don't have much left, Rob. Okay, well, that's good. That means you've been productive, uh, and, I guess. Yeah, it ha- well, and we're, it, we've been productive, and we're on a deadline, too. So uh, there is, there's that uh, aspect of it as well. So. All right. Is, it, is there nothing else out there that you've been reading that hasn't been passed yet that you'd like to make sure gets passed? Uh, Including out of the House? Or? Yeah, out, out, of, out of the Senate. Anything else that you sponsored that oh. you wish would have gone through? Um, you know, I was, I've had a really successful session, actually. Um, one of the bills, I had a bill, a locality-based pay bill specific to corrections, um, and that would have allowed that $10,000 uh, increase. Um, for just correction workers, I, I really wish we could have gotten that out just in case 593 doesn't pass. And um, I mean, in, in, in really, uh, this would have addressed the, the problem with corrections immediately. Um, you know, 593 is obviously something that's going to take a year or two to you know before we can fully implement. But um, the, the bill dealing with corrections essentially would have been immediate. So I, I really wish that one would have passed. But. Um, we ran out of time. Any changes to certificate of need out of this legislature this year? Yeah, what we talked about last week um, allows different medical facilities now to offer uh, additional imaging services. Uh, That passed out of the Senate last week. Uh, It just passed out of House Health yesterday uh, and goes to the floor over there for them to to take up. I would imagine there'll be several amendments on the floor, but I don't expect any of them to pass, or I don't expect anything to pass that would be um, detrimental to the to the final passage of the bill. Yeah, a story that I'm reading today, Jason, in the paper really talks more about Senator, forgive me, I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, Senator Takubo? T- is that right? Takubo, yeah. Right. Senator Takubo is a is our majority leader. Okay. And um, talking about his, whether he has a conflict of interest, and the story really deals more about that than it does about certificate of well, need that, completely. That so, uh, so just just let me address that real quick, Marie. Okay. Mind, is that in, in the House, there's a rule, uh, rule uh, 49, okay. and in the Senate is rule 43, where you can ask to be excused to vote. Um, and I believe that members ask that way way more often than they absolutely need to. <laughs> Typically, the, the ruling of the chair is if you are a member of a class greater than five, then you're required to vote. So, um, you know, if somebody was in a particular industry um, and there was a bill that directly uh, impacted that industry, uh, but there were hundreds of people across the state in that industry, it would be ruled that you would be a member of a class and required to vote. Ah. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, I, so Maria, since you and I both served on the airport authority at one time together, that there was a bill a bill dealing with airport uh, airport authorities in the house, and I asked for Rule Forty Nine in the house because I was on the airport authority. But because there were more than five people on airport authorities in the state, I was required to vote. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I think that that article is certainly making something out of nothing in my. Okay, opinion. yeah, I was just like reading through it, thinking, what exactly happened with C O N here? You can't really see a whole lot of that but again um yeah it's fine what will the equal protection for religion act do in your opinion jason to pass the senate 30 to 3 well you know the bill is is modeled really after south dakota's language uh south dakota implemented that a couple of years ago Um, and i think it's important to protect people's religious freedoms um you know there has been some talk about this being a discriminatory type bill. I don't believe that at all. Um, you know, I think a bill could go too far to do that. But if you actually read what this bill does, I don't think it does that. So uh, I know there's been some folks that are concerned about the non-discrimination uh, ordinances in the 17 municipalities, in 17 municipalities in the state. Um, I don't believe this bill in any way um, puts those in jeopardy if, if folks are concerned about that. But it does give some protection for Uh, religious freedom. This bill was passed in 2012 uh, out of the House of Delegates by 92 to 5 under Democratic leadership. And so the folks that are out here railing against it right now, saying this is Republicans being discriminatory, which is completely inaccurate, um, is the same bill that passed out of the House under Democrat leadership 2010 or 2012, I believe. 2012, I'm I'm fairly confident. I believe that vote was 92 to 5. No, it was 95 to 2. 
Um, but, I got it backwards. So, but in but in, um, 20, but in 2016, some of the Republican leadership uh, was uh, expressed concern about the, the the bill. Well, and 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 I, the bills were titled the same in 2016 and today, but they the, the bills don't do the same thing. And and the bill in 2012 is far more like the one that uh, was passed um, this year. Does the bill provide for civil damages or just simply a reversal or correction of action? Uh, I don't know that there's any. There might be civil damage. I'll have to look at it again. I don't want to. I don't want to say it wrong. I don't know that there's any civil damages. And actually, in a lot of states that have bills very similar to this one, uh, that that this actually has been used to protect minorities. And, and I know that's not what the other side wants to hear, and that's not the um, the narrative that they're trying to portray, but. But th- that is actually, after the implementation of RIFRA, uh, it, it's been used primarily to protect minorities. This uh, th- Typically, I think, when you think about this bill, it's that wedding cake bill about the Christian baker who did not want to bake a cake for a homosexual couple. And, and I think that started to move momentum t- mm-hmm. toward these uh, these types of bills. Uh, d- does, and Mike Hornby told us no, but does this bill provide any additional leeway for exemptions for vaccinations no quick short to the point i like the answer yeah i mean it, and that question was asked on the senate floor yesterday and and the answer is absolutely not that it does not it's still the law that you have to uh have immunizations to be enrolled in school um this does not change that law all right very good any final questions for jason just any any particular surprises? Anything caught you off guard, Jason? Your first year, um, uh, first year in the Senate. Anything that that you um, that you just said? Wow, didn't see that coming. Um, I don't know that I didn't see it coming, but it was a and, and it, it as well in a good way. Actually, is that the <laughs> ability to impact legislation in the Senate is far greater than in the House. Um, and, and and that's not a shot at the house. It's it's just different when there are 100 members versus 34. Got it. Uh, and it's just it's so much easier to have impact on legislation. It's easier to get bills through. You know, if I have a particular issue with a bill, which I did a couple of weeks ago, um, and I discussed that in caucus, and the bill was held up so that my concern would could be addressed. And nobody else in the entire caucus had that concern, but I did, and I was uh, given the. Um, uh, courtesy of, of being able to, to address, to fix a bill uh, so that I would be okay with it. So that's that's the courtesy that, that really, I, I give a lot of credit to President Blair, who, um, you know, extends all the courtesy to our members as possible to, uh, you know, to be able to work. If you have a concern or, or a problem with a bill, um, you know, unless it's one that our caucus is absolutely divided on, which you really haven't seen much of this year, uh, is that we make every effort that we can um, to, to be as accommodating to our members as possible. Got it. JB, any final thoughts? No, looking forward to passing our version of, of locality pay uh, today, and I, I think it's it's a big first step in um, or it's a big step in, in actually addressing the issue and, and moving forward with um, you know I've done a lot of things um, in support of a lot of bills for specific areas of the state that really have no direct impact <laughs> on the Eastern Panhandle, um, and I do that because it's the right thing to do, and I think you'll see members of the Senate in other areas of the state do the same thing today. You anticipate getting out of Charleston on time this year, March 11, in and out? I think so, um, and I think that largely depends on when we get this, you know, when, when the House passes the, the PEIA bill and the uh, income ta- the, the tax uh, cut bill, and I think it just de- depends on those time frames. Um, I don't think there would be a veto, but, you know, that's something that we need to be concerned about. Um, especially with a PEI bill, bill in my mind. All right, man. Have a great day. Thank you. Hey, you too. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Jason.